Good morning. Uh, today's scripture is John 17, 20 through 26. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that from the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. We have been studying what is by far the longest recorded prayer of Jesus Christ. And we have seen that this is just simply a personal conversation that he had with God the Father. And that's what prayer is for, for Jesus as well as for us. But while that is so, this conversation that Jesus had with his heavenly father was one that was meant to be heard by others. And there's, that's because there's so much that we can learn from the prayer of the one who came from heaven to earth to save us. First, we can learn about God himself, as we discovered in the first part of the prayer that Jesus, when he prayed for himself. We can also learn of the heart of God toward those individuals who had committed their lives to him, which includes us, but specifically those disciples and followers of Jesus while he was on the earth. But now in this section of the prayer, we learn that the scope of Jesus's prayer extended far beyond what anyone could ever have possibly imagined. Jesus has spoken of the church several times before this, even though there was no such thing yet, but here he prayed for the church for those who would come to believe in him after he had ascended into heaven and who, who would believe in him because of the witness and the testimony of his followers. In other words, Jesus prayed for you and me. Last week, I said that his prayer for the disciples could easily and be readily applied to every Christian, and it can. It's just that that prayer was specifically for those original followers of Christ. Now, this part of the prayer is not for them although I'm sure the content of this prayer was Christ's desire for them as well. But it is specifically for the church which was to come. And it means so much to me that the night before Jesus died, that Jesus was thinking of me as he was thinking of you, and that he went to the cross for me and you. Verse 20 says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Now, one thing that we see just from verse 20 there is the absolute confidence that Jesus had that his disciples would spread the message after he was gone and that many would respond to it. And that includes those of us here today. For even though all the disciples and all the apostles are long gone, it's their message that we believed. What we have in the New Testament is their recorded memories of life with Jesus Christ. And that's part of what makes the Bible so holy and so important. It's the way that you and I can be included in this prayer of Jesus. So Christ expected his followers to spread the message to thousands upon thousands of people, and then through the Bible to millions upon millions. I wonder if he has the same confidence that you and I would be certain to spread the message that we have received and we've responded to. For those who lived after the days that Jesus was on earth, this was the only way to be saved, for someone to spread the message. For someone to tell someone else about Jesus and about how his death on the cross made it possible to be forgiven of sin and how it's possible to live a life of righteousness. It's still the only way to be saved. All of you here today who are born again can say that they got saved because somebody spread the word to you. And so Jesus prays specifically for us, those who would hear the message of salvation, even though we didn't personally witness the life and death of Jesus. So what is it that he wants us to take from him through the message that we have heard? 
I see five things that come from Jesus, things that we can have today. Christ's hope for the church is that we take possession of what he offers to us. First of all, he wants us to have unity. Jesus wants his church to be one. See how many different times and different ways he said that? He prayed this for the disciples back in verse 11 when he prayed for their protection, which we talked about last week. He prayed, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. And now Jesus repeats this request in terms of the church, which was to come. In verse 21, Jesus prays that all of them may be one. Now, when you look at the state of the church today with all the denominations and all the separations that we have, this almost seems like a joke. You know, how can we be one when there are so many different kinds of churches? But it's so important for us to realize that in spite of our differences, Christ has made us one. There is a bond that joins all believers in Christ, and that is the Holy Spirit that indwells us. And there is so much that we have to be unified about. As Paul said in Ephesians 4, there's one body, there's one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Christ has made us one. And the tense of the verb that Jesus used there indicates that. Literally, it reads, may they continually be one, not may they become one. May they be one because he's made us one. We are one in Christ. Now, I want you to hear what I'm saying. I do not consider myself to be an ecumenical. By that, I mean, I don't believe that our efforts should be geared toward establishing a, a, a single worldwide church. I don't think we could ever do that without compromising the truth of some very essential doctrines. I think it's actually best that we have our different denominations. I have convictions as a Baptist that I'm not willing to give up. But to me, the unity of the church has to do with more than just the organization of the church or even the beliefs of the church. Because we disagree about so many things. And there's no way that we're all going to believe the same things or we're going to want to do things the same way. But I believe unity has more to do with the attitude of individuals within the church. In spite of our differences, we can be one in Christ. That's because he is the one who joins us together. We need to realize and to remember that all the who have been saved by God's grace through our mutual faith and the atoning blood of Jesus Christ are part of his church. And there's no reason why we can't worship with or pray with or fellowship with other believers, even if we don't agree with them about everything. And it serves absolutely no purpose to put down or to belittle other churches or pastors or, or to see them as competition rather than partners. We have a bond in Christ that makes us one. And that same principle holds to unity within the local individual church. Now, few churches have the unity that Christ desires for them to have. That's because people feel strongly about their churches and they want what's best for it. But most of the time that disunity happens in the local church. It's not due to a, a doctrinal error or, or a compromising of the truth. And yes, there are times when you do have to take a stand about non-negotiable doctrines, and you have to be ready to be set apart on certain issues. But most of the time, when there is a lack of unity in the local church, it's due to the attitudes of the people rather than just organizational disagreements. In fact, I hold that you can have disagreements in the church and still have unity. That's when you're bonded together by your common interest, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord. The problems come because somebody insists on having his or her own way, or arguments spring up from just petty little unimportant issues that we turn into something important. I've been guilty on both counts. There are times when I really wanted to have my own way. Sometimes little things that shouldn't bother me do. But what I'm saying is that this is not what Christ wants for his church. So let us remember that when we sometimes might haggle over the silly little things that churches tend to haggle about, that Jesus is in heaven saying, may they be one. And that leads to the second request of Jesus for his church, which is that we might have his likeness. We are to have unity because he and God the Father have unity, and we are to also to have his likeness. Verse 21 goes on to say, may they also be in us. It's significant that Jesus prayed this for the church, that they are to be in him, meaning that we should be like him. 
Now, it would be one thing for Jesus to pray this for the disciples because they saw Jesus in action. They lived with him. They heard him speak and teach. They watched his example day after day. They were there with him. They had the example to follow. But it is the desire of our Savior that all those who would eventually come to believe in him would also come to eventually be like him. That is the ultimate goal of us as Christians, isn't it? To be more and more like Jesus. Well, just how is that possible then since we've never seen him? Well, the wonderful reality of the Christian life is that we can still know Jesus as our dear friend. We can still learn of him by discovering his revelation of himself to us. That's why it's so important for every Christian to spend time in God's word. The more we learn about Jesus and his ways, then the more we can emulate him. That's why it's so important for every Christian to pray. The more we talk to Jesus, then the more we learn of of who he is, his personality, and, and just who it is that we are to be more like. And this was Jesus's prayer for us, even before the church was formed, that believers, those that would come to be believers, would be like him. And that in turn leads to the next part of Jesus's prayer, and that is his desire that we might have his testimony. That is why he wants us to have unity. That is why he wants us to have his likeness, so that when the world looks at us, then others might come to believe in him. Verse 21 finishes by saying, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. This is the way that it's worked through the ages. Those who lived with Jesus heard his teachings and received his salvation. They were obedient in being his witnesses to the uttermost parts of the earth. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, they recorded the events which took place. They shared their spiritual lives in letters and in personal relationships. They built the church which Jesus said would be built upon their faith, that that rock at the gates of Hades would never be able to overcome. And despite the many failures of the churches over the years, this one thing is true. Because people were able to see Jesus in the lives of those who had trusted in him, the church continued to grow and to prosper. And now, 2,000 years later and 6,000 miles away from the original site, you and I can know Jesus Christ because of the testimony of the church. So what other conclusion could there be than to say that it's up to us to continue this? It is Christ's prayer that the world may believe because they see Jesus in us. You who believe today are here because somebody sometime brought you to church or told you about Jesus. And it's Christ's prayer that this pattern continue. Is there anyone who knows the Lord because you told him or her about Jesus? Has the church grown even just a little because you brought someone in? Every Christian should be able to say that, and I hope each of you can. And if you can't, why not do something about it? An entire generation could be lost because we fail to pass on the testimony of Christ. We see now the continuing connection between these different aspects as we see the next thing that Jesus prays for us. Next, he prays that we might have his glory. Jesus himself connects all these different thoughts in verses 22 and 23 says, I've given them, meaning us, the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, unity. I in them and you in me, likeness. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you love me. That's the testimony. And then he goes on to clarify in verse 24. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Jesus makes yet another reference to to the fact, as he did, as he began this prayer, uh, to the fact that he existed before the world was even created, that he has always existed, and he always shared divine glory with God the Father, making him one with God, as he said a number of times. And here we, we find the doctrine of the Trinity, that Jesus is equal with God, an important aspect of our Christian faith and lives but that Jesus gave up that glory to come to earth and die for us. And his prayer, his deep desire, is that we would be able to see him in his true glory. The disciples did to some extent. They saw him do miraculous things. A few actually saw him transfigured to his glorified body on the mountain with Moses and Elijah. All of them got to see his resurrected body and to watch him ascend up into the clouds as he went to heaven in glory. But now poor us. We didn't get to see any of that stuff. But we're promised that we will. 
We are told that Jesus is going to return the same way that he went up in glory. And we're going to get to see him and to get to be with him. And Jesus is looking forward to that as much as we are, as we can see from his earnest prayer. But in the meantime, he still gives us his glory. Every time we pray, we are with him and we sense a part of his glory. Every time we worship, I mean, really worship, we catch a, a little glimpse of eternal glory. Every time we follow his example and we, and we forsake our own will for God's will, there, there's glory in that. Every time we witness, whether we see any results or not, the glory of God is upon us. And one day we will bask in that glory because that's what Jesus prayed for. That's what Jesus wants. Now to sum up everything that he wants for his church, by the church, I mean those who did not get to see Jesus walk the earth, those who did not feel his healing hand upon their head, those who were not held as children on his lap, those who did not get to listen to his parables, Jesus wants us to know that we are loved. Everything he did was out of his love for us. It's, it's the heart of the gospel. As you read in verse 26, I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Jesus wants us to know his love. And it is, it is a love that we can take and own as, as what belongs to us. It's his gift to us. It's the theme of scriptures from beginning to end. God's love for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. No greater love is anyone than this, that he laid down his life for his friend. Jesus loves you. <laughs> it's almost a cliche. It's a statement that's used so much. But Jesus prays that you will know that, that you will cling to that. And that you will let that knowledge make a difference in your life. Whether you've known this for years or whether you're just starting to truly realize it. Please be strengthened today by the knowledge that Jesus loves you. Jesus is praying for you. That you might have his unity. And be one as his body, the church. That you may know his likeness and, and strive to be more and more like him every day. That you may know his testimony and be able to share it with others. And that you may know his glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Glory that we will one day see face to face. And then in all of this, that we might know of his great, great love for each and every one of us.